first uh, scripture reading this morning is from Psalms, Psalm 131. Hear now the word of God. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. And from the New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 through 34, the story of Paul and Silas in prison. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Send forth your Holy Spirit, O Lord, into our hearts and minds that we might hear your word in these words. Amen. Joy is such an unusual habit of the Christian heart. Annie's 87-year-old mother, Joan, lives with us in a small apartment in our home. Annie's, uh, Joan's husband, Annie's father, was a minister on staff of a large conservative evangelical congregation in Southern California for many, many years. And you might call Joan a refugee in these days from American dispensationalist fundamentalism. She's thrilled to be out of that situation at this part, uh, during this part of her life. Well, as I was preparing this sermon, I 
knocked on Joan's door, the door of her little apartment, uh, just, just to visit. She asked me what I was doing, and I told her, well, I'm, I'm working on a sermon on the topic of joy. Well, her response was less than enthusiastic. Her, her, <laughs> her face fell. She was not exactly joyful. As we spoke further about it, it seemed that the word joy, this word joy had been often used in her church in ways that made her feel very, very uncomfortable. Evidently in her church, people were told in no uncertain terms that they had to be joyful. They had to live, and I quote her words here, <clears throat> victorious Christian lives, no matter how they really felt. Because joy was so pervasive in the Bible, it was supposed to be <clears throat> a universal fact for everyone. You weren't a good Christian unless you had a big beaming smile on your face. Unless you were fulfilled and whole in Jesus Christ, even if you were miserable. And unless you could produce other evidences that you lived in victory. Quite often this way of thinking, as I understand it, had the effect of making Joan feel that, that she had to put her real feelings up on the shelf, push them away as negative, treat them as second-class citizens in her life of faith. So when I told her that I was going to preach about Paul and Silas singing hymns in prison, hymns of praise and so on, she mumbled something to the effect that, well, they probably had three to four hours of intense personal struggle for every praise song they sang. <laughs> and kind of looked at me, you know. As you can tell, I have a very smart mother-in-law. And I take her point. It seems, yes, that joy, the word joy, has been co-opted by well-meaning people, by purveyors of the prosperity gospel, by possibility and positive thinkers, and others in our self-fulfillment-based culture. The mall bookstores are full of books with joy in the title, Finding Our Joy, or Joy-Filled Living. Usually, however, this kind of joy knows nothing of lament or real suffering and the deep relationship between joy and human suffering. And this is not the kind of joy that I come here to preach about today. My conversation with Joan sent me to my bookshelf. I remembered a book by Catherine Green McCrate, a wonderful book entitled Darkness is My Only Companion a Christian response to mental illness. I remembered that somewhere she had written in that book about her joy. Catherine struggled most of her life with, with mental illness and was officially diagnosed as bipolar. For Catherine, joy never negated or overruled her feelings. It was impossible. It was not an escape valve that, that, that blew the top off of the reality of her daily struggle. It was not the, the high five or the end zone dance of victory. Rather, she calls joy deep, the, the deep calling deep in her life. And because of this, she chose Psalm 131 as her conversation partner as she thinks about joy. Listen again to the words of that psalm. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a child quieted at her mother's breast, like a child that is quieted is my soul. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. 
For Catherine, joy comes not as she raises her eyes too high and tries to transport herself out of her situation. Rather, it comes as she calms and quiets her soul, becomes a child at God's breast, experiencing that relationship, that relationship quieting her soul. It's there in that place where praise then erupts and she sings her doxology of hope and of praise. Now, I'm not saying that joy doesn't involve some whooping it up. There is indeed a certain kind of ecstasy in Christian joy, but it's not the ecstasy of the victory dance. It's the ecstasy of the love dance. It's an ecstasy that increases and becomes more vibrant as our relationship with God develops and changes over the course of a lifetime. Perhaps we can imagine it this way. A mother bends over a child's crib and hands hands him a, a rattle. The baby recognizes the gift and returns the mother's smile, smiles back. The mother can't resist that smile, so she reaches down and and she tickles the baby's feet. The baby screams in delight and and kicks his feet. So the mother starts cooing, and the baby responds with strange gurgling noises. And soon the room is is filled with their sound. And then the mother can resist no longer, so she she bends over, she swoops down, and she, she grabs the baby out, and she hugs the child to her face. Of course, the child responds by grabbing her cheeks. And then she swings him up around her head and in the air, and the room is just full of their noises, their laughter. Christian joy, as Catherine McRae says, is deep calling to deep. It's it's a matter of relationship, of call and response in a relationship. It wells up with, with centripetal force, if you will, within a relationship of love, in which we respond to God's grace and love for us with our own laughter and songs of joy. The joy that we discover in this joy spiral with God changes all throughout our life. It takes a different shape, that call, that response with God. But the dance of joy goes on, even in times of suffering, when the circumstances change. Christian joy is not a victory dance, it is a love dance. That's what Paul and Silas were caught up in that day in prison. And it was a spiraling, it was that spiraling love dance, if you can imagine the dance with their feet in the stocks, that shook the jail to its foundations that day. It made the earthquake just the way it had at Jesus' crucifixion. But we have to be a little bit cautious. The story of Paul and Silas shows us that joy is not just about finding and celebrating that place where deep calls to deep in our individual lives, but it's also about sharing and expanding that call and response, involving others, other prisoners, even the jailer, and and many, many others in the same dance with God. We often think about this as evangelism, and it is that. But to see it as only that would be to miss something central and profound about this story of Paul and Silas in jail. They are singing, expressing joy in prison. And prisons in Luke Acts are nothing short of microcosms of the entire society. They're pictures of the system all around us, the social system. In other words, joy can be an agent of change, of profound social change, a power for the liberation of captives. 
Martin Luther King Jr. once said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Chuck Campbell, who teaches homiletics at Duke, uh, teamed up with Johann Silliers, a, a, a um, homiletician and theologian, South African. And they wrote a book recently uh, entitled Preaching Fools. Preaching Fools, the Gospel as a Rhetoric of Folly. It's a wonderful book. They argue in this book that the joy of the gospel looks like foolishness to most, but it is, in fact, a little bit like the Buddha's smile. Foolishness that resists the true foolishness of the systems of politics and war and violence in this world. In our case, as Christians, it's the foolishness of love. Chuck Campbell tells a fascinating story in this regard towards the end of the book about visiting a chapel that had been built on the border between South and North Korea. I don't know if any of you have been there. I, I actually had a chance to visit that chapel. I know exactly what he was talking about. The chapel is, is round, and you enter through the back of the sanctuary facing the chancel area. So you're facing the chancel area when you enter. And the entire front of the chapel, as you look uh, towards the, the front, is glass, a huge glass window. So through the window, you see the hills of North Korea, off in the distance, the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, fences, barbed wire, it's as if that's the whole point of the chapel. The people who worship there have to look through that window the whole time. There's no way the way that chapel is built for you to avoid, if your eyes are open, looking towards North Korea. So as they pray and sing and praise and confess, they have to look north. They have to look through that window toward their enemies who are also of course, their brothers and sisters, and in many cases, their actual family members. What Chuck Campbell draws our attention to, however, in this is that right in front of that window stands a very small pulpit. And every worship day, the preacher then stands right there between north and south amidst the barbed wire, the fences, the guns, with nothing but the word. The preacher preaches as the congregation looks toward their enemies who are also their brothers and sisters, and the preacher keeps on preaching week in, week out. In Chuck's words, they are keepers of the word. Fools for the sake of Christ. Paul and Silas in prison were keepers of the word. They were fools for Christ, just praying and singing at the top of their lungs. And, Paul, and, and Luke wants us to know in no uncertain terms that this singing had the power of an earthquake to change human hearts and to liberate to liberate us all from hatred, from violence, from injustice, from all the prisons that bind us in this world. Do I have any bluegrass fans in here? You bluegrass fans are likely to know an old Stanley Brothers bluegrass song that I love dearly. The words go like this, Paul and Silas bound in jail all night long. Paul and Silas bound in jail all night long. Paul and Silas bound in jail all night long. Who shall deliver for me? Who shall deliver for me? But it's the third verse that I love the most. That old jail, it reeled and rocked all night long. That old jail, it reeled and rocked all night long. That old jail, it reeled and rocked all night long. Who shall deliver for me? Joy, 
joy, an earth-shaking habit of the Christian heart, joy shall deliver for me. And if we are to be willing to be keepers of the word, fools for Christ, joy, I believe, shall deliver for the world. Amen.